So today I'm joined by Pat Cahoon, who is a CEO of Expressive. Pat, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So Pat, you have a, a prolific background when it comes to patent filings as well as publications. I think about some 35 patents, 16 publications, and yep. uh, you've done a lot of research around standards and protocols, uh, yep. everything from lightweight access point protocol to uh, control and provision wireless access points to IPv4, EAP, L22P, and so forth. So would you say kind of your first and foremost, your passion kind of originates from research? Um, I wouldn't call it research. I think I'm, my passion is really around building things that people want to use. And I think when you take a look at some of the publications or even some of the patents that I actually have, um, it, they were not necessarily done for the purposes of doing research, but they were really done because I was seeing a pain point that existed, and I felt like there was a need to go solve that pain. That's beautiful. So really an inventor with uh, uh, a passion for application and That's right. that, seeing that come out, come, come, come out. And of course, a lot of the work that you've done affects millions of people around the globe, right? Yeah, that's right. And, you know, in, in my early, in the early part of my career, and I did dabble in research and I worked for some research organizations and so on. And I, I, I do love creating, but what I actually found is that creating for the sake of creation doesn't excite me at all. And that was sort of what led me to start my first startup is I really wanted to focus on building something that people actually cared about consuming as opposed to something that could eventually see the light of day. So uh, you're referring to your first startup, which is uh, Airspace, which uh, right. you sold for $450 million. That's right. For the co-founder and CTO. Uh, tell us about the technology around the centralized Wi-Fi architecture and uh, WLAN. What was unique for that point in time and how did it actually move the needle? Yeah. Um, so this is, it was kind of an interesting problem that we were trying to solve. At the time, uh, Wi-Fi was just nascent and it was being used by very few organizations that actually had a real need to use it. So think um, manufacturing where it's impractical to put Ethernet cables on the manufacturing floor. So they had a tendency to use, to use wireless. Um, but some progressive organizations started seeing value in perhaps using Wi-Fi inside their organizations. One example would be Microsoft, right? And in their world, when they deployed Wi-Fi, it, 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 almost, it more than tripled the amount of resources IT needed to manage the infrastructure. Because remember, at the time, all these access points were really, never really designed for the enterprise. So imagine the access point you have at home. Multiply that by thousands and thousands of devices. And so now IT finds itself where they're, they're managing thousands of devices individually that were never really designed for enterprise class. So what we decided to do was really design, and we actually, we, we modeled it based on the way that 3G was actually designed, where there's a central controller and there's radios that are kind of sitting out into, in, you know, in, in, uh, in the environment. And so we kind of created this a similar architecture. We wanted to have the central brains and then have these access points that were actually fairly, they were basically just remote radios, if you will, and allow IT to be able to deploy Wi-Fi, but have a centralized management so now they can actually scale. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I'm, I'm just thinking, my goodness, you literally opened up the floodgate and no wonder the valuation was there because not only because of your sales volume, but you're talking about a portfolio of patents that represents really uh, everything else because uh, it doesn't make any sense to manage those devices on an on a individual basis, individual node basis. So the fact they can centrally manage your pr rights and privileges, provision things, control it, uh, it it's exactly. very logical. And in fact, this was also my first foray in what we'll call, I guess today's called machine learning. At the time, we didn't use the word machine learning. But one of the problems that we were trying to solve was in IT, very few people even knew how to spell RF. And how does one manage RF to get really good performance? Well, the, the reality is in the world of Wi-Fi, if you're not managing your RF, you're getting very poor performance. And nobody in IT actually knows what to do with that. And so what we did was we built a series of algorithms that really understood the overall environment and can tune all of the RF configuration to make sure that it had provided the best performance possible. And so really all the alg algorithms that were written is in fact what today people would call machine learning. 
Now, for, for listeners that are, not, that are not familiar with some of the terminology, uh, RF uh, obviously stands for radio frequency. That's and right. you're talking about the algorithms that learns and understands environmental needs. And That's depending right. And on spikes and valleys and so forth, you're basically amplifying or increasing certain RF for certain usage versus, let's say, taking some of the resources from elsewhere. That's correct. Okay, Absolutely. fantastic. Well, I'm really enjoying this conversation. Um, I mean, clearly, you, you have a really great balance of technical as well as the leadership. So um, I, I could see why this eventually led you to your current startup, which is Espressive. You raised some $23 million as of last year. That's right. And my understanding about the enterprise service management sector is that you have these chatbots that you know, give uh, users typically multiple articles to read. And of course, many of us have experienced this on e-commerce sites and other places, including uh, in, you know, internally within our enterprise. But the problem is, when the users get inundated with all these things that they have to look through on their own, they just get fed up and they just end up opening up a, a trouble ticket or request. So how is Espressive different from what's already out there? Yeah. So um, a little bit on why I started the company, because I think that may provide some insight. Um, so I was running products at ServiceNow, one of the largest service management companies in the world. And what I was hearing consistently from IT leaders and HR leaders is that ServiceNow had helped them digitize a lot of the back office processes, which is great. The, the service, service desk agents actually had a tool that they could use. But when it came to the employee experience, it was still like 1995. People are largely just emailing and calling for help because of the experience that you just talked about. When somebody would go to a portal and they type a phrase in, um, as an example, how do I install a printer? Um, they would they basically get a, a, a slew or many, many articles that they could read at their leisure. And the reality is Marion Finance doesn't have the time to actually start reading all these documents. And a lot of these documents are so technical, she doesn't understand them anyways. And so she's just looking for an answer. So we decided to really start a, a new approach, a, a brand new approach that really leverages the advances in AI, in machine learning, in natural language processing, uh, to be able to deconstruct what somebody is expressing in a phrase and provide an, an Alexa-like answer. Now, when I say an Alexa-like answer, you think about Alexa and you're asking Alexa, Alexa, what is the weather today? It's not providing you with a series of websites that you could choose from to go and pick. It just tells you the weather. And that's really what people want today. When they have a problem, they ask a question, they're just looking for an answer. Does that make sense? Absolutely, and thank you for providing that context as well, because if you look at your work history, it looks like you were primarily focused on wireless and, and security side, and then you made that transition. Uh, so yes, I think the previous job makes a lot of sense in terms of identifying that market need and being able to address it. You know, it's kind of like, unlike Slack, where it started with kind of an internal usage and became external, what you're talking about is addressing the internal issue that's been plaguing lots of, <laughs> lots of employees for many years. Now, and, and, oh, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, in, in fact, I gave you an IT example, but you think about a, an employee that works for a large organization, 5,000, 10,000, 100,000 employees, the questions that they have is not limited to IT. They could have a question about their paycheck. Maybe, either, maybe they just had a kid and they're trying to figure out uh, what, kind, what do I need to do. Maybe the conference room is too hot or there's a projector that's not working or, or maybe the photocopy machine is not working. All of these different problems, there's a different person or group that's responsible for providing a resolution. For an employee to navigate all of these different intranets to go figure out who's supposed to solve this particular problem, it's overwhelming. And so part of the problem that we were also trying to solve is not how do we pe help people get answers to their IT questions, but how we, do we provide them with a single place they can go to and ask virtually any question. And then we use a lot of AI technology behind the scenes to go figure out what the answer is. And when we don't know the answer, we use AI technology to go figure out who is the likely owner of that answer to make sure that we're connecting the dots so that the employee gets the help that they want. But the innovation at, 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 at Espressive is not just that. It's the fact that when those humans interact, we can learn from that interaction. So the next time, we don't actually need a human to, result, to provide an answer to the question. Yeah, that's, uh, that's fascinating. And I think one of the, you know, the biggest challenges with uh, natural language processing as it relates to existing chatbots is that they tend to look for very specific phrases. That's right. Or words. And if they don't find it, they're going to just give you some, something random. 
And I think the competitive advantage that espresso, uh, espresso that you're mentioning is that sophistication and the breadth of its taxonomy and ontology engine where the relationships uh, that are over, I think, some 500 million phrases across 4,000 topics. That's right. Means that the AI is learning and continuing to refine those relationships so that even if you type it in the most kind of strange phrase, the system can understand that, oh, this relates to this particular topic and I can pull up this response so that it's on point every single time. Is that right? That's right. But it's also learning because the reality is five, 500 million is not sufficient. Uh, you know, people will ask phrases in a variety of different ways. They're going to use different synonyms, different phrase structures. And so our system, when it doesn't know, we recognize that. And, and we have a team that basically gets notified and we fix those problems. And so if you think about why Alexa or Siri has been, you know, increasing, increasingly being successful in understanding what people are saying, and you are correct that they're, you know, they're, they're very specific phrases, but nonetheless, the accuracy is getting better and better with time. And it's because you have millions of consumers using it on a daily basis. And so you have a team that has enough data to be able to tune the engine to, under, you know, to really understand what people are saying. In our world, in the world of enterprise, this is a challenge because there isn't a single company out there that has enough data to be able to construct an engine that truly understands all the different permutations. So we've come up with a model that basically learns from across all our customers in a way that's fully anonymized and we have no proprietary information. All we know is what people expressed. If I said something like, Am I allowed, allowed to wear a kilt to work today? Which, by the way, happened a couple weeks ago. Um, you know, if the engine doesn't understand what the word kilt is, we will be notified that somebody asked a question about a kilt, and we'll add that, and then all our customers get the benefit from that. Well, as I'm listening, uh, of course, uh, at the end of the day, it's all about data and feeding that AI system. That's uh, right. It, it kind of begs a question of, you know, it, it's too bad that uh, you guys have not been acquired by ServiceNow as an example where, you could get into a large data footprint that start to really allow the systems to learn. Because right now, uh, every instance is specific to an enterprise, correct? Or is there a superset that learns from each of the enterprise and puts it into the master uh, learning system? And that's, that's exactly our architecture. So we have a master. So it's, it's, think of it almost as a crowdsource model, although that word worries me a little bit because, you know, it, in, the, in the world of enterprise, people worry about privacy and, you know, and, and, and confidentiality. In our world, everything is scrubbed. It's fully anonymized and we remove people's names, project names, and so on so that what we see is something that's really generic. Um, but that's what's allowed us to be successful is we have a large number of customers and we're learning from across the farm. Fantastic. So let's get into a little bit of the innovation. Um, yeah. When we think about innovation, what do you feel like is one of the most important things to consider? The people. The people. Um, you know, and, and I've worked at a number of different companies, and in the end, um, you have to have a team that has a focus. When a team actually had, when you give a team a goal as a leader, you have to make sure that the team knows what you're trying to execute on. That to me is probably the, having the great team and the right vision is most important in actually making sure that you're building the right innovation. But I've also seen a, a number of instances where people are building innovation for the sake of innovation, right? There's a lot of that that happens. And so the magic here is to really understand your customer, interact with the customer, and really understand the pain point. And there's a key difference here between understanding the pain point and what they're asking for. Because a lot of folks, what they do is they'll actually under, they'll listen to what the person is asking for and they're gonna go build that. The reality is most people don't really know what they want. They just know that they have a pain point and they're looking for a solution. And so true innovation is, is a science where you have to be able to dig into understanding what people is, are saying and come up with a really innovative solution. So, so that brings up a good point. Uh, I recently published on Forbes this notion of the fact that we shouldn't start with business requirements because exactly what you're saying is if we just literally take verbatim what the customers or the users are asking for and you deliver that, it's not going to necessarily hit the bullseye. But rather, if you can take essentially kind of a higher abstraction of the benefits or the needs that they really want, then you can actually go beyond that. Because to your point, beyond what they see, they can't imagine anything above that. And this is part of the reason why companies like Amazon and others are able to innovate beyond users' expectation because they understand the fundamental uh, highest need space that they're looking for. Now, you mentioned team. 
and execution. And when you mentioned team, you're talking about level five leadership. How do you find, how do you identify level five? And, and, and really it's giving those level five managers autonomy, the independence and the resources to execute. So tell me how you go from vision to execution with the right team. Yeah, well, you know, in, in a startup world, uh, we don't have that many layers, right? So on purpose, um, everybody basically um, is, is an individual contributor. But I think a lot of this is you have to provide them with freedom, but you also have to provide them with some, with some, some direction. Right. Everybody has to know what the what the North Star looks like. And then you and then you empower them to go and and create. And for me, first, first, I had to find the right team. And I think what, what we did at Espresso was actually really important. You know, we, we I needed to make sure that I built the best product in the industry. And so to be able to do that, you have to you have to have the right DNA to attract the right people. And I think if you're in if you're a, a an engineering leader, you're looking for somebody who can inspire you to go build something really cool. A lot of really great engineering leaders are not just looking for a mechanical job where they're just basically, you know, pumping out product after product. They're looking to do something really innovative. So somebody that has the right background that's demonstrated that they know how to innovate will attract the right engineering leader. Mm. So that was really critical to me. And then my, the other piece that was really important is making sure that I have a lot of domain expertise. So my head of product was actually the first product manager at ServiceNow. He understands that business inside out. He understands the customer pain. He understands how, how the comp competition have actually built solutions, what's worked and what hasn't worked. And this is an opportunity to go build something from a, a clean sheet, sheet of paper, really looking at where the industry should be as opposed to where it was 10 years ago. Um, but, you know, I interviewed a lot of people in, in, for product management and a lot of them were unable to separate themselves from how things are being done today. And so I had to go find that person that was, at, that, was, that, that was a visionary, that was willing to go and leap off the edge and do something brand new. And I actually got really lucky that I got a really, really good head of product. And again, it's the same thing with my customer success team, my marketing person. Um, a lot of this is that they are looking for somebody that will inspire them, that will give them an ability to create something really exciting. And they know, they know when they meet someone, they meet, meet a leader, they'll know whether this, this is that kind of person or if it's purely an execution person that only focuses on getting something done, which is very important, by the way. <laughs> so you, you bring up some really interesting, fascinating insights. And I have to ask you, the kind of talents that you recruit for your startups, is that vastly different from when you're in a corporate organization at an SVP level? the type of people you recruit because the fact that innovation and the scale of innovation is different at large enterprise versus a, you know, yep. early startup, you find have, you have to find different personalities and profiles. Can absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So when I was SVP at service now or some of my other gigs prior to that, um, if you try to find somebody who's an innovator to be, to, to report directly to me to go and manage a team, that person will be very, very frustrated because mm -hmm. that's not the role. The role of that team is to manage an organization. So you're looking for somebody who's just a fantastic leader. It's really, really hard to take someone who's a pure innovator and, and that's what they want to do and throw them in a, in a, in a pure leadership role. It's, it's, just, it's just the wrong DNA. And so when I was at you know, my previous gigs, when I was looking for somebody to drive a business, it had to be somebody that had a vision, of course, but it was somebody that was able to manage a team to go and execute on a vision. It's just, it's a very different set of skills that are required. Great, great, great points. Thank you so much. Uh, the question that we always ask our guests is, what was your biggest innovation failure and what lessons did you learn from it? Wow, my biggest innovation failure. Um, I'm not gonna mention the company name, <laughs> um, but I got wrapped up into this really exciting project that sounded like it was really cool and I could, in my mind, I could see how it could really change the way networks could be constructed and uh, in, 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 in ensuring that security was actually, the security problem was finally delivered. It was finally solved. And so we built this incredible technology. I mean, it was really, really cool. The only downside is it required people to basically rip out all their infrastructure and start over again. And I think for me, that was a really interesting interesting uh, lesson learned 
that when you build something, if you don't take into account that there's all this legacy infrastructure that has to be, it has to be reused. You can't, nobody's going to basically rip everything out and start over again, that it will never see the light of day. And so, you know, I believe that that particular technology has progressed in a really good way since then. But um, to me, that was a really, really big lesson learned. Well, you know, I think your point actually is so, so on point as it relates to why exactly robotic process automation is so hot these days. RPA is specifically addresses what you're saying is it doesn't try to go in and do major heart surgery. Rather, it's able to do things at the, the user interface level and basically replicate human actions and events. So yep. great lesson learned. And the key is that it's not always about the technical sophistication alone. It has to work with in a business context. That's right. Now, how can... Uh, listeners and uh, viewers follow your work as well as Espresso. Well, obviously our website, uh, www.espresso.com. But we also, uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, and I actually do, uh, I also do a lot of, um, uh, I do, I have a lot of activity in Quora. So for people who are asking questions about startups and looking to, you know, how do I do this and looking to be a founder. So in my very little spare time, I actually do try to provide and give back to the community for people that are struggling and trying to figure out how to be successful as a founder or, you know, get funded or what have you. Um, so those are different ways to do it. So terrific. So today I've been joined by Pat Calhoun, CEO of Espressive. Pat, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much.